So first of all, I guess, welcome to the February Sustainability Series. Um, this is a monthly sustainability series that we hold on the third Wednesday of each month over the noon hour. So thank you everybody for being here. Uh, this month, we're excited to be hosting Amanda Holloway and Brett Gordon from Mayo Clinic uh, to learn about their sustainability journey and some of the things that they've been up to over the past few years. So um, I'll get out of the way and turn it over to them uh, for what should be a very exciting presentation. So thank you both for being here. Great. Thanks, Kevin. So welcome, everybody. We're going to share um, some information about Mayo Clinic's sustainability journey. But before we do that, just a little bit about Mayo Clinic. We are one of the largest academic medical centers in the United States with medical destination sites in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, as well as Jacksonville, Florida. And we have dozens of hospital locations in our Mayo Clinic health system in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa. And Mayo Clinic cares for over 1 million people per year from all 50 states and nearly 140 countries. I always like to start off uh, presentations about Mayo Clinic uh, with a mention about our values. So uh, our primary value is the needs of the patient come first, but um, I also wanna point out that one of our core values is stewardship and the way that we define stewardship. Stewardship is sustaining and reinvesting in our mission, whoops, and extended communities by wisely managing our human, natural and material resources. For this presentation, we will be focusing on Mayo Clinic's campus in Rochester, Minnesota. And uh, in Rochester, we have three separate campuses. We have our downtown clinic campus, as well as our Mayo Clinic Hospital St. Mary's campus and Mayo Clinic Hospital Methodist campus. Uh, in Rochester, we have over 34,000 employees, 21 million square feet of space. That does include our parking structures. I think without parking structures, we're about 16 million square feet feet of space. So we have a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity when it comes to energy conservation as well as sustainability uh, opportunities on our campus in Rochester. So why is environmental sustainability important for a healthcare organization? And the answer really is health. It really centers all around health. Healthcare is responsible for 10% of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. Healthcare also represents 18% of the US economy and 10% of the global economy. So we have a significant amount of sway uh, when it comes to things like purchasing um, and those types of uh, the materials that we're using. Healthcare is responsible for 9% of criteria air pollutants. And this fact always surprises me when I, when I mention it, but one routine surgery produces as much garbage as a family of four in one week. So healthcare is really resource intensive. Uh, we use a lot of materials in the care of patients, um, use a lot of energy. And so that's why uh, environmental sustainability is, is really important in the healthcare environment. Some fun history facts about Mayo Clinic's journey uh, with sustainability in the early 1900s, Dr. Charlie Mayo uh, was responsible for establishing the garbage collection service for the city of Rochester. And not many people know that, uh, but this initiative was started as a public health initiative. Uh, so prior to this garbage was collected and disposed of in ditches and sort of unofficial uh, kind of mini landfill spaces. And it really was a public health um, issue for the community. So um, Dr. Charlie Mayo started the garbage collection service for the city and sent uh, that material, the rubbish waste to the Mayo farm as animal feed for hogs. And this is a photo that I was able to obtain from our um, historical society, which is kind of neat. So that was the early 1900s. We move into the late 1960s and the Sisters of St. Francis were responsible for starting the metal recycling program. And they started this as a way to raise money for the Pavarello Fund. Uh, the Pavarello Fund is a fund to help patients of St. Mary's Hospital cope with medical expenses. Uh, one of the late sisters, uh, Sister Vera, would, and this is so cute, but she would put on dancing shoes, turn on some jazzy music, and dance on the cans to crush them. 
uh, so that they could collect more cans and take those in for recycling. So it's kind of a neat uh, recycling, early recycling story in Mayo's history. We move uh, fast forward into the mid uh, 2000s, 2009. And uh, this was the first green committee. We formed a green committee in Rochester. And the idea behind the green committee was really to engage a wide variety of departments across the organization. So um, departments like facilities and nursing, education, supply chain, our food service team. This was a way to engage um, a lot of different departments in our sustainability initiatives. And that quickly uh, resulted in forming a enterprise green advisory council because you know we recognize that this is uh, an opportunity for the entire organization and all of our sites uh, some additional green committees were formed in arizona and florida as well as in the mayo clinic health system um, and we had a lot of success with our green committee structure we still have the structure in place but in 2017 we noted that even though we have this great structure in place, we're still somewhat limited and dispersed. And in order to really form an integrated approach to sustainability, we needed uh, to take this program further. And so in 2017, uh, we started a project to create a business plan for uh, taking and growing our sustainability programs. And that led to launching our uh, Office of Sustainability in 2018. So the Office of Sustainability is relatively new in the organization, but is really um, helping take this great framework and uh, kind of background that we've created for sustainability and take that forward into the future. So our Office of Sustainability uh, we're a small group within the clinic. Um, Dr. Henry Tazelar is our outgoing chair, so we're just in the midst of a transition with our physician leadership. Um, Dr. John Dillon is coming in as our new chair. He uh, is out of our Rochester, Minnesota campus and um, is a physician in nephrology. Uh, so it's great to have a physician partner, especially as we look at opportunities for uh, environmental opportunities within the practice and how we're providing care to patients. Another aspect that's been really important for sustainability is having an executive champion. And Kathy Frazier is our chief human resources officer, and she is our executive champion for sustainability and has really been instrumental in helping open those conversations with our leaders uh, about sustainability opportunities. And I mentioned our committee structure. I'll just quickly show this. Uh, we do have, still have our committee structure in place. We have an enterprise green committee um, as well as subcommittees then at each of our sites. So Florida, Arizona, we have a Rochester subcommittee and then health system subcommittees as well. And the subcommittees really play a key role in carrying out those sustainability projects for each of those campuses. From an enterprise level, the Enterprise Green Committee, we set kind of that strategy for sustainability at Mayo and um, come up with some key topic areas or create that standardization. And then the subcommittees really help um, put those into practice across the organization. And our sustainability focus areas really encompasses all of our operations. Uh, as you can imagine, we have opportunities to improve um, environmental practices regardless of what we're doing. Uh, so whether it's how we're handling our waste, um, how we're engaging our employees, the chemicals that we utilize, the food that we provide to patients as well as visitors and our own, own employees. Uh, greeting the operating room, activities in the operating room um, are quite important because operating rooms are very resource intensive within a hospital system. Uh, supply chain is incredibly important as well. We purchase a lot of materials to care for our patients as well as in our laboratory settings. Brett will talk more about energy as we look at um, energy conservation initiatives, um, but we're also looking at how we're using our water in building and operating and maintaining our buildings, as well as our climate impact and uh, transportation as well. So we have uh, a lot of opportunity to kind of spread the wealth when it comes to looking at environmental sustainability opportunities. 
one of the ways that we're creating some of that standardization is through policies. And it may not sound very exciting, uh, the creation of, of policies, but in a very large organization, uh, this is a great way for us to create consistency in how we approach environmental sustainability in our operations. Uh, thus far, we have an energy policy as well as energy management guidelines, uh, an environmentally preferable purchasing policy, which really helps guide our purchasers to more environmentally preferable products. We have a waste management and recycling policy that helps um, guide our work units towards waste reduction, as well as a preference for recycling versus uh, throwing materials away. We have a mercury elimination procedure uh, across the organization. And then our newest policy is the sustainable building policy. This was created, uh, launched, I should say, at the end of 2019. And the purpose is really to incorporate sustainable building design, construction, and operation strategies that support health and well being. Uh, one of the important components of this is uh, we did create a healthy and resilient facilities guide that accompanies the policy. And this guide pulls from a variety of different standards, including LEED, so Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, um, FitWell, the International Well Building Institute, as well as RELY. So it's pulling a variety of different um, design strategies and uh, helps our design teams put the, um, the policy essentially into play or into practice. And our policy is uh, divided into a few different sections with a focus on healthy and resilient sites. So really looking at those environmental protection practices, uh, as well as resilience opportunities to help the organization be more resilient in the face of um, emergencies, or extreme weather, those types of things. We also look at healthy interiors, uh, which focuses on health and well being of our building occupants, whether that's patients or visitors and employees. And then lastly, wise resource use, really looking at those conservation opportunities and creating efficiency. So I mentioned that Brett Gordon will be talking, doing more of a deep dive into our energy program, but wanted to mention that one of the roles for the Office of Sustainability is helping finding funding and uh, for energy conservation so that we can accelerate our work across the organization. In 2019, we were able to secure close to a million dollars in additional funding for energy conservation projects, mainly focusing on uh, lighting retrofits, um, tra transitioning to LEDs, as well as we got some funding for a utility plant upgrade on our Florida campus. And then in 2020, we were able to also secure some additional funding to, again, focus more on LED retrofit projects for the Rochester, as well as our La Crosse campus. One of our projects uh, that Brett and I have been working on is a sustainability dashboard. Uh, as you can uh, imagine, the metrics are really important as we measure our impact, whether that's the how much waste we're generating or uh, the energy that we're utilizing. Uh, we're creating this internal sustainability dashboard to help us um, better control the, the metrics or have a way to manage those that data and then uh, provide some reporting. And so what I'm showing here on the screen is an example of the waste dashboard for the Rochester campus. And you can see um, I'm showing 2019 data. We haven't dug into 2020 yet. I'm super curious with um, the COVID pandemic, what the impact will be to the waste streams, because I have a feeling uh, 2020 is going to be a bit of an anomalous year with um, how things have shaked out, shaken out. But with 2019, you can see that the Rochester campus recycled uh, approximately 32% of our waste. Um, we do have 56% of our waste is municipal solid waste. Uh, so I'm guessing there's some opportunity there to um, transition uh, some additional recycling or increase our recycling rates. We have about a 9% um, 9 of our waste is regulated medical waste. And for a healthcare organization, that's typically one of the more expensive waste streams. 
as well as you can see some small um, hazardous waste streams as well. But this dashboard will really help us manage um, and track progress as we put um, you know, additional waste programs in place. Wanted to mention our recycling center, because this is something that's a little bit uh, unique in the healthcare industry is on our recycling on our Rochester campus, we do operate our own recycling center. And the recycling center has been in operation since 1990s. So we have a lot of experience with this facility. We have 10 full-time employees and a variety of recyclables that move through that uh, recycling center. And hopefully you've had the opportunity or seen uh, some of our blue recycling trucks out on the road as we travel in between our campus buildings to pick up pick up recycling. Uh, but this is a, a big opportunity for us is um, finding ways to divert material from the waste stream and into the recycling stream. It's been a bit of a struggle with the, the last couple of years just because of the uh, recycling markets and the impact um, that that has had. But thus far, fingers crossed, we continue to have luck with marketing our materials and finding uh, appropriate recycling um, outlets for those. One of our uh, newer materials, I'd say within the last five years or so, is expanded um, into polystyrene recycling. Uh, we have a significant number of laboratories on our campus, and so we've been able to find an outlet for recycling shipping containing containers as well as packaging materials, and we do some of that processing within the recycling center. I'd mentioned earlier that our operating rooms are uh, really resource intensive uh, spaces within hospitals. And so a lot of our activities have been focused particularly on the operating rooms. Um, one of the areas that we've been focusing on is finding additional recycling outlets for plastics within our operating rooms. And there's a photo here of what we call um, blue surgical wrap. So um, what typically happens with surgical instruments before those are steam sterilized, they're wrapped in this blue surgical wrap. Uh, the materials are sterilized um, and then the wrap is typically thrown away. But that wrap is actually a plastic, it's a polypropylene plastic. Uh, and so we've been able to find a recycling outlet for that uh, material. So it's collected and baled at our recycling center. And uh, we're also collecting some additional plastic items from our operating rooms, saline bottles, some rigid plastic trays. But it's also important to, for us as an organization to focus on opportunities to reduce our waste. And one of the ways that we can do that is through um, utilizing reusable sterilization trays. So this helps prevent the use of blue wrap. We still have some uh, blue wrap in the system because not all surgical instruments fit inside these trays, um, but we're able to use these reusable trays to prevent the use of uh, that disposable material. We also have a program for collecting single use surgical devices. Uh, so some surgical devices are noted as being single use. However, the um, FDA has granted approval to reprocess certain devices. So what happens is in our operating rooms, we collect these devices, essentially preventing them from going into the waste stream. Um, and those materials are sent to a third party processor where they take apart the single use devices, they clean the devices, they sharpen components components if they're needed, put them back together, and then each device is tested. Uh, and then they're sold back to healthcare organizations at a reduced cost. So this is a great way for healthcare organizations to reduce the waste stream, but then also reduce uh, expenses as well. We had a quick question in the chat, Amanda. Sure. Um, silver and lead were listed as being recycled. Can you explain how you go about recycling those and what the sources are? Yeah, so our lead, um, the lead is uh, primarily lead aprons. You know, when you get your x-ray, typically they'll put some, a nice lead apron on you. Um, sometimes those lead aprons uh, get busted up or torn or what have you. And so um, those are recycled. Uh, we send that to um, 
a smelter essentially to uh, recycle the lead. And then silver, a lot of the silver uh, comes from x-ray film. And most of our x-rays are now digital, so we don't have quite as much x-ray film as we used to, but we still have some in storage that, you know, we hang on to patient records or x-ray film for a certain period of time. And then um, when those are released, uh, we send those to a company that can help us uh, reclaim that silver as well. Um, and so there's a nice uh, revenue opportunity with uh, reclaiming that silver from the x-ray film, as well as being environmentally responsible. Um, I noted, wanted to just quickly note, uh, we are targeting some energy conservation opportunities within our operating rooms. Uh, so uh, surgical suites or operating rooms typically aren't utilized all of the time. Uh, and so we have an opportunity to set back those air exchanges during those unoccupied times, which help, helps us save, save energy. And anesthetic gases are also an opportunity for us to reduce our environmental impact. Um, anesthetic gases are potent greenhouse gases. And, you know, they last anywhere in the, in, in the atmosphere from one to 114 years. So um, we are looking at ways that we can more responsibly manage our anesthetic gases, as well as see if there are ways to transition to um, anesthetic gases that don't have quite uh, or have a reduced global warming potential. Uh, so some opportunity there as well. Our food service teams have been uh, really great and active partners in our sustainability journey. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, just the opportunities that uh, the food service teams are coming up with, you know, with really having a focus on local and sustainable purchasing. You know, we're looking at cleaner foods. And when I say cleaner, you know, meaning things that are foods that are less processed, uh, more whole foods, uh, healthier foods, and looking at a sourcing responsible foods, whether that's responsible seafood or antibiotic free meat and poultry, those types of materials or those types of food streams. There's also been a significant amount of work on responsible serviceware purchasing. I think that's probably the number one comment we hear from patients and visitors, as well as from our own employees, is our use of styrofoam. And so within this last year, the organization made a commitment to eliminating the use of styrofoam in our retail settings, so our cafeterias and our cafes. And the team uh, put in some significant effort to find alternative products um, and eliminate the use of styrofoam, which is great. So, and it's interesting, um, there's a need for disposable products, but we always go back to the preference for increasing the use of reusables because that is the most environmentally preferable um, way to go. And so our food service teams are also looking at ways to uh, encourage people to eat in the cafeterias. I know things are a little um, awkward at the moment during kind of in the midst of a pandemic, but as we pull out of out of the pandemic, um, I'm hoping to see more reusables in our system. Food service teams are also looking at ways to reduce waste within our food production. And so we're looking at ways to recover food. Currently on our Rochester campus, we do collect food that is still um, edible and usable and send that to community food response so that we can help community members in need. Um, but there's opportunity for us to also reduce our waste, whether that's um, in the kitchens during food preparation. Um, and right now our food actually goes in two different directions. We collect uh, food waste and it goes to a company. Um, some of it's composted and then some of it goes for animal feed. There's also opportunity um, the food service teams are looking at uh, resource management. So the equipment that they're buying, uh, ensuring that we're reducing our energy usage, looking for ways to conserve our water in our kitchens as well. As an organization, we're also moving towards more plant forward meals. Uh, and this includes within the patient rooms, but then also in our offerings for visitors as well as employees, encouraging more of those plant-based meal, uh, meal offerings. And community outreach is also of interest and an important component of 
um, the, what food service does. We've had some um, opportunity to do some community outreach outreach through like the farmer's market, uh, but moving forward into the future, I think there's some um, interesting opportunities that we can look into with ways to um, share our food philosophy with, with the community as well. So I mentioned that we have over 34,000 employees in Rochester organization wide. We have over 60,000 employees, which means we have a huge opportunity to engage our employees in our sustainability journey. And many of our employees are passionate about environmental sustainability and they want to engage in help and uh, help the organization make improvements. So we created a green advocate program where employees can volunteer to be the champion for their work unit. And we have them focus on work unit and work unit improvements because they really know their operations the best. Uh, so they're looking at ways to reduce waste, reduce energy, to educate their colleagues, um, on environmental sustainability, as well as things that they can do with the work unit and at home. And our green advocates are role modeling sustainable behavior. They're helping us foster a, a culture of sustainability. Um, and so if, uh, if we have anybody, any Mayo employees that are currently watching this, um, I'd love to have you sign up as a green advocate uh, to help the organization as well. We've had some recognition for our sustainability programs and efforts in the past. We are a member of an organization called Practice Green Health. Uh, they are a uh, networking membership organization that targets uh, helping healthcare organizations be more sustainable. And we've had a variety of um, recognition from them. I'm really proud of the fact that this past year in 2020, we were awarded a Circle of Excellence Award for our efforts to green the operating room. And that Circle of Excellence Award uh, notes the top 10 facilities, healthcare facilities within the United States. So that was pretty neat. Um, and we've also had additional recognition from the American Society of Healthcare Engineers and the Environmental Protection Agency um, for our energy conservation efforts as well. And lastly, before I turn it over to Brett, I uh, wanted to share with you some of the things that we're working on for 2021. I mentioned the sustainability dashboard. Right now, we mainly have Rochester information in that dashboard, and we're working to expand that out across the organization, um, targeting right now energy and waste, and we'll be uh, targeting water at some point in the near future continuing our work with the greening the operating room, specifically around energy conservation and anesthetic gas reduction. Uh, we're also continuing to look for ways that we can find our uh, find funding for energy conservation work so that we can accelerate um, that energy conservation, those efforts. Uh, I'm excited that we'll, uh, that we'll be able to have an Environmental Defense Fund Climate Corps Fellow this summer help us uh, put together a framework for calculating our carbon footprint. I think that uh, is a big job and uh, something that's really important for us as an organization. Um, we'll also be moving forward with our sustainability roadmap within food service and then growing our green advocate program. And so with that, I will turn it over to Brett Gordon to share uh, some more information about our energy conservation. There's a couple of questions for you in the chat, actually, sure. Amanda. Um, a question about the da dashboard. Uh, what t type of tool is that? So the dashboard, there's kind of, there's, uh, we do use a, an external vendor. Uh, that has helped us put that dashboard together. And there's a couple of different components actually that Brett will go into and describe um, how we're capturing the energy portion of that dashboard. Uh, but right now, what we, for the waste side, uh, we're having our colleagues, whether in facilities or environmental services, um, enter their information into a, like a spreadsheet template, and then we can upload that spreadsheet into the dashboard. And then the dashboard does its magic with putting the numbers in the right places. Gotcha. The dashboard was really born out of our uh, online network metering system that we have for our uh, downtown campus, Methodist campus and St. Mary's campus that are served by our power plants. Um, so we were able to pull that data real time into a 
into a platform. So we we kind of developed this platform and uh, working with Amanda closely, we uh, we turned it into more of a sustainability platform and and not just energy. Nice. Yeah, thank you. And then um, does Mayo have solar on any campus? That's another question. Yeah, we do. We have solar on our Rochester campus here in Rochester on the Damon parking ramp. It's a little hard to see from the street level, but we do have a um, 150 kilowatt uh, array on top of the, the Damon parking ramp. I should mention across the system, we do have several campuses that take part in uh, community solar programs. Um, so that's been really helpful within our Mayo Clinic health system. Um, a lot of those sites have been able to take advantage of those uh, programs. That's right. Great, well, thanks, Amanda. I'll uh, jump into the energy conservation portion um, of the presentation. It's amazing when, as Amanda goes through that, just to see how sustainability touches on so many aspects of our organization. I'm, I'm just gonna dive into one here, the energy conservation part of things. Let's see if I can get the uh, controls to work. All right, great. So Mayo's been on this, um, Mayo Clinic in Rochester really has been on this uh, energy conservation program uh, journey um, ever since I arrived uh, here at Mayo um, back in 2012. I think this all started around 2011. Um, as you can see the graphic on the right, I took this right out of the Energy Star Guide and I think Mayo has done a good job of, of really following that best practice of, you know, uh, when we started this whole thing, leadership set a goal, 20% reduction goal in energy use intensity, that's KBTUs per square foot of owned uh, space to reduce it by 2020. Uh, so leadership made that commitment and then uh, staff assess where we were performance wise, put together a plan. We've been imp implementing that plan ever since 2012, tracking our progress. And we reached that goal back in 20, at the end of uh, uh, 2017. Of course, we celebrated it and shortly after set a new goal because <laughs> we wanted to keep challenging ourselves. So we have a new goal of reducing that EUI, energy use intensity by 30% in uh, 2025. So we have some, um, here's a graphic to show the, the progress and, and where we've been and, and where we are. Um, if you look back, what we do is we, we continue to um, track our progress versus our baseline. And our baseline is uh, 2010, we were at 308 KBTUs per gross square foot. You can see by the line, I don't know why that did that. You can see by the, uh, here we go, by the line on the top there, we continue to keep pushing that down. It's flattened out a little bit over the last couple of years, but we're at, we're at 239 at the end of 2019. So that would be a 22.4% reduction. So we're, we're moving towards our goal. The green shaded area really is that accumulated sa savings. And what that is, is, um, that's comparing to business as usual. So if we were still at 308 today with our current square footage and current energy rates, we would, that's the, that's the amount of money that we would have um, spent on energy over that amount of time. Another, um, another graph to show uh, progress and how we're working towards our goal um, that I used to track is, is this EUI trend. So the red, the red bars are the actuals the actual EUI at the end of each year, which is basically just all of our KBTUs for electricity and gas and fuel for all our facilities in Rochester, divided by the total square footage. And that's what we end up with. The green bars are, are basically the goals for each year. And what that does is that gets us down to that 215 out to the right there at in 2025, that's the eventual goal. That would be our 30% reduction. So as long as we stay below the, the green bars at the end of each year, we know we're, we're working towards our goal. So what have we been doing to get to, to reach these goals and what are we doing to continue to try to push our, um, push the envelope? Well, one of the main tools that we've implemented back in 2011, started piloting retro commissioning, been doing it ever since. And this, this program was put together to basically retro commission um, 
about 50 buildings across Rochester um, by the year 2020. We got thrown off a little bit last year, um, so we haven't quite we haven't quite, I just saw somebody said need a more aggressive goal. <laughs> we haven't quite uh, um, finished all of those buildings, but we look forward to finishing up in the end of uh, probably next year. Another thing is staff engagement. I think retro commissioning has really helped us with that because our, our facility staff have learned the facilities even more in depth um, and how, how they use energy and ways that we can save it. But also it goes beyond just the maintenance staff. It's also uh, project or uh, project delivery folks who have really taken the ball and run with it on new projects because we do take credit for uh, new construction, major remodels. When we if we can um, reduce our energy footprint by remodeling a building, great. If we can it, um, if we can affect the big picture by adding a new facility that's extremely energy um, efficient, that's great too. So retro commissioning. For those of you that may not be familiar with it, it's a systematic process to improve an existing building's performance. So what you do is you, um, what, our, what our process is, is we engage with a outside engineering consultant, especially for our larger buildings, basically buildings over 200,000 square feet or that utilize a lot of energy. So kind of have that EUI over 200 KBTUs per square foot. And, that, and the consultants lead us, lead us through a process to basically assess the determine how the systems were designed to operate and, and find those operating, those deficiencies that exist today and some energy saving opportunities. We then basically create a, a to-do list for our teams to go and make corrections. Um, some of those are easy, just programming co corrections on the building automation system. Some of them are more capital intensive and we put them on a list and we have to take forward for through our our funding process to take a little longer, but it gives us a really a great to-do list and, and things that we can tackle and plan for each year. Um, we've done over 9.3 9 million square feet so far in our existing buildings since uh, 2011. And the average reduction has been about 16% after we do that. Um, and then the other challenge to that is some of those buildings were retro commissioned in 2011 or 12. so. It was quite a while ago. The other challenge to that is to maintain that 16% or 20% or whatever it is that we saved and not let the buildings get back uh, out of, I call it out of whack, if you will. Some other, some other things that, have, that we've uh, used as strategies, uh, Amanda mentioned LED lighting upgrades. It's been a huge um, energy saving opportunity for us um, throughout, you know, we have a lot of square footage. Here I have a couple pictures of existing ramps. On the left is a is the Graham ramp, as some of you may know, as a patient visitor ramp, um, completely um, replaced all of the LED, all of the fixtures uh, with LED fixtures in that ramp. And the other picture on the right is one of our um, employee ramps, the West employee ramp. And that was done. A lot of this work was done in house, some with, um, you know, mostly with our um, internal maintenance staff. So, um, just as regular business as usual operations. Some was done with, with contracted help. One thing that's interesting too, it's not just the energy savings, but you can see how bright that is. And, and it's really improved the quality of the lighting and the, uh, and the safety aspect that goes along with that, especially as people are um, going into the ramps late at night. More LED lighting retrofits. So we get into the buildings. We've We've uh, really tried to be intentional about going back and retrofitting many of our existing facilities. It's part of our, anytime we do a project now, our project delivery folks have it baked in into the uh, standard specs design guidelines that we're gonna do LED lighting with new projects. But what about those existing facilities? So you see a list here of some pretty large facilities that we've, we've uh, completed the LED lighting retrofits on. Um, I just wanna point out the, for instance, the Gonda building, we've done the upper half. And part of that was, that was we used that funding that Amanda mentioned that we were able to, to um, capture through a uh, partnership with her. And on that project alone, if once we get the whole Gonda building done, and that's the goal, it's gonna be over a um, half a megawatt of demand reduction for our campus, um, just to put it in perspective. Another, Another interesting one, at least I find interesting as a mechanical engineer is duct sealing. Um, this has been a, a great strategy for us. It's 
basically things you don't see in a building, but any building that's got older ductwork um, would not be sealed um, as per today's standards. Um, so it's a huge energy loss, obviously, if you're, if you've got, in, in, especially in commercial buildings, you've got a lot of ductwork, you're moving a lot of air, conditioned air, and if you're losing it along the way, you have to create more to keep the building, um, the, the building temperature uh, comfortable for the occupants. So we, this process is, uh, we, we've seen a reduced leakage of by 95%. And anecdotally, uh, we did this in the Guggenheim building, which is a 22 story uh, lab and research facility. We have obviously some really large air handling equipment in there. And, and we, just by sealing all the supply duct work, the mains in that building, we, we uh, captured back about 42,000 CFM of supply air that we did not need to supply to the building. So what that meant for us um, was almost a whole air handling unit that we captured back, which has created a redundant air handling unit for us, which increases reliability on top of all the energy savings that goes along with it. Brett, there's a couple of questions for you sure. in the chat. Um, one that is regarding uh, installing new, more efficient boilers in downtown Rochester, but still gas fired. Uh, what is Mayo doing to clean up the air downtown in the long term? Basically, net zero carbon. Well, we are we are replacing our boilers in the in the Franklin heating station right now. That's going to increase our efficiency um, a great deal in that uh, facility. So we're going from boilers that were from the 1950s, you know, 60 some percent efficient, the boilers that are, you know, brand new. So 80, 85 plus efficiency. We're also, we're continuing and trying to expand on our cogeneration capability, which um, we're still, it's still gas fired, but we're basically, we're creating the steam to heat the buildings and, and cool the buildings as well too. But we're also getting those, those uh, additional electrical kilowatts out of that process. Um, I think I think what it hits on. I was just going to say, really, our focus the last since I've been at Mayo is the energy conservation. We're really trying to reduce our our demand side, and which will greatly increase our chances in the future of offsetting and and uh, and getting to a more carbon neutral uh, state down the road. Awesome. Um, one other question. So how do you expect major changes in workforce not needed on site to impact future plans for consumption, um, consolidating buildings, continue buildings not heated or cooled at normal rates, et cetera? Yeah, we've actually, that's a great question. We actually have seen that um, on the meters, you know, just throughout 2020. And we've got a lot of buildings that the, uh, the site-based DUI has, is, is lower than 2019, obviously, because we were able to put the building into a, kind of a conservation mode, if you will, reduce ventilation, lower set points, those sorts of things. I think moving forward, um, we're, we're not sure because I think we're, if, if we have buildings, we're gonna wanna utilize them. So I think we're gonna, um, if they get, when and if they get reoccupied, I think there still will be people in them and they'll still be um, using energy. It'll be interesting to see how, how they are utilized. But in my mind um, with people, administrative, functions taking place more at home or off campus, wherever we're working remotely, that allows space for more intense operations <laughs> in the future. So I'm not sure if that, if it's going to reduce our energy footprint or if it's gonna eventually impact it even more. Great, all set from the chat, thank you. All right, yeah, thanks. So I, I mentioned integrating energy efficiency into projects, that's another uh, one of our strategies um, that we've, we've baked into our guidelines, our specifications, the enterprise energy policy and guidelines. Um, so these are huge contributors, these new buildings, major additions. I put up a couple examples um, of EUIs on newer facilities that we've built, Jacobson building, highly intensive building. It's got ORs, it's got the proton therapy, but still um, greatly outperforms some of our older uh, hospital buildings. Uh, the Dan Abraham Healthy Living Center, 130 kbTUs, one of our one of our really well-performing buildings, and the Generals expansion, which I'm going to highlight here in a little bit, 
um, all the way at, down to 72 kbtus per square foot. So you can see some of the um, energy efficient design standards, pretty, um, pretty common in the industry, LED lighting, efficient envelope, replacing our controls so we can get better control of the buildings, efficient HVAC equipment. And then what I'm gonna highlight with the general expansion is the use of EUI targets for new buildings. So jumping right into that, the Generalist building is an uh, inpatient outpatient facility on the St. Mary's campus. You can see a picture of it there. That's the, that was the existing facility a couple a few years ago. Um, the project was a vertical expansion that added three floors, about 150,000 square feet to it. And our uh, project manager uh, for Mayo is Karen Finneman Killinger, our construction manager, Mike Craven. And, um, and then Ken Potts and myself were, um, some subject matter experts just um, helping out with the project from the uh, energy side of things. So what we did on this project is we, we created a performance goal, an energy performance goal and tried to set a target EUI just for that, just for the addition. So just the additional floors on top. So we wanted the, we wanted the, we asked if, um, we asked Karen if she would be interested in, in doing this and she was um, on it right away. She, uh, uh, was willing to try this this new approach, which was great. Um, we basically took benchmarks throughout the uh, throughout the country using Energy Star, using some other data to try to get an idea of where should we be with this target. And uh, basically, you can see you know inpatient benchmark at 205, outpatient. So we use the, the square footage of the different types of space to come up with this 122 average um, kbtus. Uh, the goal I should mention was actually modified down to 81.6 during the design, and, and that's a credit to our, our uh, design team, which was uh, HDR out of Omaha. They wanted to account for the shelled space. They they, they didn't want to take uh, make it too easy on themselves, I guess, if you will. So, what did that process? How did that process work out for us, and and how did it how did it affect the project? Well. When you design a, a building of this of this magnitude, a project of this magnitude, the designers are going to create some models and they're going to design and, and they're going to do some energy um, calcs to make sure they get things sized properly. But what this really did for us was we went all the way with it. So we did a full energy model. The team did a full energy model, 87, 60 hour a year model to try to um, see where the EUI would be based on the operations, based on um, how the equipment's running. And then we could run different alternatives, different scenarios for building systems, envelope systems, um, how we operate the building, all of that. So we can inform decisions before the final documents were made. <clears throat> Some of the energy efficiency measures that were um, tested in the model, you can see the list here, you know, the envelope was a huge, huge deal. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but lower power, lower lighting density, daylighting control, um, all of the efficiencies of the equipment um, were put in there. Heat recovery, obviously a big one. Um, uh, dedicated outside air system uh, that plays right in with the heat recovery. And then high efficiency roof with R30 insulation. So what the energy model does is it helps you to say, okay, if I, if I pay this much more for extra insulation on the roof, am I gonna get a payback on that? Am I really gonna save enough energy? And, and um, it helps you inform these decisions. So as a great example is the exterior envelope investment. So uh, Ken Potts put this great uh, little graphic together. So the first pass at the design was a curtain wall, all sides, just a glass curtain wall uh, for all the, for the whole building. The EUI, according to the model came in at 138. So that wasn't gonna meet our goals from an energy side of things. So then the uh, design team came back with another option okay, well, we could do the curtain wall and to meet, to get the uh, energy goal closer to the energy goal, we met, we got to 125, we'd have to do triple glazing. So, um, you know, some of the best uh, glass you can get. The problem with another issue with that was it becomes so heavy that the existing structure wasn't gonna be able to handle it. So then that pushed us to another option. Okay, what else can we do? Well, there's a rain screen option. So that what, and basically, it was reducing the window to wall ratio on some of the sides of the building and, and um, using spandrel glass and see where, how we can get to that 122 
EUI. And what was really interesting is that that option got us to the energy goals, met the aesthetic look that the organization and the design team really wanted to reach, but it was also the uh, less, uh, the least investment upfront, which is just, you know, that's kind of a win, win, win all the way around. So just a, a couple of uh, renderings to show this was the, uh, of the final solution. So this was the, uh, like I said, the curtain wall in the north face. Um, it turned out to be 55% vision, 45% spandrel. And spandrel is basically just glass with insulation on the back. From the inside of the building, you can't see out. <laughs> it's just, but from the outside, it looks like window. And then on the uh, east, south, and west sides of the building, we did the rain screen insulated metal panel system and turned out to be 24% vision glass, 20% spandrel, and 56% metal panel. And what's interesting is, you know, that, that original idea of all curtain wall really was would have been way different than any other building on that campus because um, I think the 24% window to wall ratio is still higher than any other building on that campus. So how do we measurement and verification? So we, we went through that process. We set a, we set a target uh, for the design team, the construction team. It was in their contract to meet this um, but we had to also be able to measure it, right? So we have to know if we actually met the goal. So the design team was responsible for the performance of the, of the uh, design. The construction team was responsible for making sure everything was built and performed the way it was designed. But we also put the design team in, in made them responsible for the measurement and verification plan. So that way during the design, they could design in all the metering that they would need and set up the system so that they could be metered so we could show that only those three floors were being measured and what their performance was. And then put in this, the level of metering needed from their side of things to be able to troubleshoot in case, um, case we didn't meet the goal. Um, so a little bit of an added challenge as you're adding on to the top of existing infrastructure, but knowing this upfront, they were able to uh, design systems organize electrical panels and piping systems so that they could get the proper metering in place and be able to measure it. Uh, we leveraged our existing networked metering system, the uh, dashboard as Amanda showed that platform. Um, it was nice that we already had that in place. So we leveraged that to capture the data. And then we provided that data on a daily basis back to the design team so that they could put it into their tools, whatever, however they wanted to track it and report it at the end of the, uh, at the end of the process. Well, I guess I should step back to another important aspect of this was all the way along the way, we had our maintenance teams involved in the process and made them well aware of what the goals were and what we were trying to achieve. Because once this was built um, and, and to have a true measurement and verification process for 12 months, we had to make sure we didn't tweak the system. We didn't change anything. We didn't, uh, and if we did need to change something, because of a performance issue, it was communicated to the whole team so that uh, any adjust adjustments to the model or anything like that could be made. So I know this graphic is extremely hard to read on here, but uh, just wanted to show, this is just uh, the report that our design team put out. Uh, they, they tracked all the data every day, they summed it up. They, they tracked heating degree days, cooling degree days to, to see if we had any major anomalies for that 12 month period. But um, the big thing is, is that it shows that we, the total EUI at the end of that 12 month period was 72.1. So um, we reviewed all the data and looked at it and, and uh, truly the modeling was, was fairly accurate and they even outperformed what the, uh, what the revised goal was. So here's a picture of the, the final building. Some of you may have, may have driven by or seen it. Um, this a, turned out to be a great project. Keys to success were, you know, we decided to do this and committed to it really early before we even sent out requests for proposals for design. Um, so that it was in the contracts, everybody knew what the, the goals were and we had an integrated team of the design team, the owner, the construction management team, and then and even the uh, operation and maintenance teams. So I was just gonna touch on some of our monitoring, measuring, and data management. So this is kind of how we're, we're still continuing to evolve our energy conservation and our energy management programs at, at uh, Mayo. So 
Here's just a couple of graphics. Uh, the, the larger one to the right is, is a dashboard. That's one of our real-time dashboards. And these are accessible uh, for all of our Mayo Clinic employees on, from our green at Mayo Clinic website. There's a link. Uh, this one we're showing just happens to be the Gonda building. So it uh, gives a little information about the building and then shows real-time uh, what the electric demand is, what the steam demand is, what the chilled water demand is, and what that means from a utility cost per hour. It's, you know, it's constantly updating and, and what that means from a EUI perspective. Um, throughout our downtown campus and our St. Mary's campus, we have these networked meters on all of our chilled water, steam, and electrical. So yeah, Kevin's telling me I gotta hurry up, so I'll, I'll uh, <laughs> try to wrap this up. Um, so basically the data sources are, you know, our network building meters and our monthly utility bills. So um, we have these different platforms. We have our real-time data. We have analytics tools that we can use, but then we're also implementing this utility bill management system. And that's what's gonna help us to pull together all our data across our, our whole organization enterprise wide uh, because everybody gets a utility bill. Not everybody has online metering, but everybody gets a utility bill. So if we can get that into the same platform, we'll be able to compare ourselves against ourselves. And also we can push it to Energy Star and, and use those tools as well. This just shows kind of how that feeds in. I, um, this is just to show that utility bill management system and, and the process that we use internally. So like I said, everybody gets a utility bill and they have to get paid through supply chain we're just capturing that, a copy of that, putting it into a server so that we can then capture the data by using smart technology to scan the, the uh, proper information off of those bills and centralize it. And like I said, that's gonna, you know, the goals are to centralize the data across all of our facilities so that we can, we can report out and compare organization-wide, by region, by campus, by building, um, and track performance towards our goals eventually there that's pretty much wraps it up for me awesome well thanks brett and, and amanda um i'm willing to hang out for another minute or two if there are questions from the group uh before we part ways for the day i had one question about your performance-based procurement process brett um having worked through it once it sounds like it's what are the plans for its use in the future? Yeah, yeah, it was uh, very successful and, and great question. We have a, another facility, uh, lab research facility that's being planned on the downtown campus right now and we're using the same process. Again, we set a uh, target for that as well of 175, I believe. Awesome. Would you recommend it for other organizations that are considering oh. the builds? Yes, absolutely. I highly recommend it. it. What I really loved about it was throughout the whole process, um, every almost every design meeting, every construction meeting, if there was a, a decision being made, it wasn't the only consideration, but at least it was always talked about, well, is this gonna affect the UI? How does this affect the UI? And uh, it's great to have those conversations and, and have them early on. One follow up on that was, what was your main resource for setting up your performance-based process? or top two, two to three resources? I would say um, Energy Star. We also had a, um, an outside consultant, uh, Slipstream. They had, they had approached us because they had a grant to actually try to get this process more um, commercialized and more, uh, popu more popular uh, in the industry. So um, they helped us with some of the wording for some of our contracts and things like that. Awesome. Thanks, Brett. And one other question for Amanda. Are there uniform set standards? In terms of energy, you know, I had mentioned the policies. Uh, you know, that's one way that we're creating standardization across the organization. And even, you know, as Brett talks through the, the energy, um, a lot of uh, the policy is really setting that standard for the entire organization. Um, yeah, that's how we're creating consistency and standardization. Cool. Um, one other question regarding styrofoam. Amanda, you mentioned the elimination of this in the retail part, but not the patient part of food service. Does this mean that plastic utensils and styrofoam are still used by patient services? 
Um, are there alternative products that have been yeah. considered? That kind of thing? Yeah, no, that's phase two of, of our process. Um, we've had to put pay, phase two on pause just because of supply chains involvement with the pandemic response. Um, but yeah, that's part of uh, part of our move towards eliminating um, styrofoam across the organization. Nice, awesome. Any final questions? I think most people were typing in the chat. Really uh, huge thanks to both of you for doing this. Um, really appreciate it. It was great information that you shared um, and obviously a lot of interest from the community about it too. So just want to say thank you one last time um, and uh, really appreciate your leadership on the sustainability and energy efficiency realm for the community. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. All right.